Now, ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat. You see before you David Cole. David Cole is uh, one of the leading legal commentators in America. You have read his work in The Nation and in the New York Review of Books, where he has uh, established himself as the literal successor to Ronald Dworkin, who was the great New York Review commentator for a long time. Uh, but he's developed his own distinctive and incredibly illuminating voice on every topic that he writes about. He uh, is also an old friend, a professor at Georgetown University Law Center, an extremely distinguished Supreme Court advocate who's litigated many significant cases, including, my goodness, it's such a, an amazing list, Texas and Johnson and uh, U.S. versus Eichmann, both of the flag burning cases he argued before the Supreme Court. He also argued the National Endowment for the Arts versus Finley, which challenged content restrictions on National Endowment for the Arts funding. And then I saw this argument, which you talk about in the book, didn't quite win, but was a, a valiant effort, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, which challenges the constitutionality of a statute prohibiting material support for terrorist groups. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming David Cole. Thank you. Thank you. David, you told me about this wonderful book when you were thinking of writing it a few years ago. And the thesis is simple but powerful. And what's so important about this book is you actually do the reporting that narratively establishes a thesis that others have noted. But you're, you, you, you put it so clearly. You say that constitutional change in America has come not mostly from the Supreme Court or from, or from federal judges, but from civil society, from citizen activists, from the ground up rather than the top down. Tell us more about that thesis. Right. So, I, you know, I've been a constitutional lawyer and a constitutional law scholar for about 30 years. And uh, I teach it the way most people teach it um, and the way the newspapers uh, report it. Uh, and that is by focusing largely on the Supreme Court's opinions and the arguments made uh, by the justices back and forth and the arguments may be made by the uh, lawyers who appear before the court. But my sense was that that's really a, a very partial uh, account of how constitutional law actually evolves in, in the United States. And so um, what I wanted to do was look at the what I consider really the three most successful um, constitutional reform efforts of the past 30, 40 years and look at how it was done. Um, so how did marriage equality go from unthinkable, which is what it was just 25 years ago, to inevitable, which is what it was uh, when the Supreme Court was, wa was, we were waiting for the Supreme Court to decide it uh, last summer. Uh, how did the individual right to bear arms, which Chief Justice Warren Burger dismissed as uh, fraud, he said one of the greatest frauds perpetrated by the American people in my lifetime in 1991, how did that become a constitutional right in 2008? And, and, and what caused President George W. Bush uh, in the um, wake of the war on terror to, by the time he left office, curtail uh, most of the rights abusing measures that he had put in place in the wake of, uh, of 9-11? Um, uh, very different from the sort of history of presidents during wartime who have had essentially unchecked power to deal with the enemy in the way that they deem most fit. Um, President Bush uh, released f over 500 of the Guantanamo detainees by the time he left office. He had emptied out the CIA black sites. He had uh, suspended extraordinary rendition, the practice of abducting suspects in one country and then delivering them to Syria or Morocco or Egypt so that they, their security services could torture them for us. Uh, he had suspended the CIA's torture interrogation program. Uh, he had put the NSA's warrantless wiretapping program under judicial uh, supervision. Um, you know, wh wh what caused him to do that? And, 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 and in each of the, so, I, so those are the stories I wanted to look at. And in each I found that the real drivers of constitutional change were not the courts imposing their will from above. Uh, the kind of picture that Justice Scalia gives us in his dissent in Obergefell, the, uh, the, the, the same-sex marriage case, um, but rather th the people acting through organizations that uh, 
of committed citizens who share a particular vision and work together in a, in a patient, incremental, strategic uh, way to change the ground, the background against which the constitutional question is, is framed. Well, it's an incredibly powerful argument, and the power of the book is in the marvelous details about how this change occurred. And I want to go through each of these three stories. And let's begin in the middle, actually, with the Second Amendment story, the NRA. Uh, you're quite generous to the uh, Second Amendment activists who you give great credit for having a sincerity of view and the importance of protecting liberty and for being very effective in actually transforming the constitutional debate. You talk about how uh, we moved from a world where, as you said, Chief Justice Warren Burger could dismiss as fraudulent the idea that the Second Amendment is an individual right to one where the Supreme Court recognizes it. And I want to begin, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I miss no opportunity to plug the incredible interactive constitution. This is going to be the only plug, uh, but it's, re it's relevant to David's point. Um, USA Today last week called this an internet sensation and noted that it's gotten five million downloads since it launched last uh. September, so it's really taking off. But David, in his book, you'll see that there's a point to the plug, notes that at the time of the framing of the constitution, only two states recognized the right to bear arms as an individual right. And if I were better at scrolling, then I would go directly to the homepage, and we see David's great plug, and then we go to here, we go to the interactive constitution, and here we can trace, look at the Second Amendment, and note, here it is, that two states, and David mentions them, Vermont and Pennsylvania, talk about it as an individual right. So Pennsylvania says, the right of the citizen to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. And then, isn't this cool that you can look at all of the documentary sources of the Bill of Rights? Vermont says, the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state. But all of the other revolutionary era constitutions are more concerned about not having um, state militias Disarmed by a federal standing army, and Virginia is paradigmatic. So, David, there are the texts, and they confirm your point. Tell us about how we went from a world where two out of the 13 colonies recognized it as an individual right to one where a majority now of state constitutions and now the Supreme Court have done right. so. so. So, so one thing the NRA recognized when it sort of uh, undertook a, a conscious campaign to um, protect an individual right to bear arms was that they couldn't just file a case in federal court and make that argument. There are a hundred years of precedent just rejecting the notion that the Second Amendment protects anything other than the state's power to have militias to, uh, to, to check federal uh, tyranny uh, and not an individual's right to have uh, arms. But what, So what they did was um, turn, essentially adopt a kind of federalist strategy uh, use the states as a laboratories for experiment for constitutional change. And, and they worked at the state level, uh, which is, after all, where most gun laws are enacted, um, to change state constitutions so that they did, in fact, reflect um, and explicitly protect an individual right to bear arms or were interpreted to uh, protect an individual right to bear arms through state litigation that the, uh, that the NRA did. Uh, they also used the states to enact a whole host of statutes that protected um, the right to bear arms, concealed carry permitting laws, uh, the um, stand your ground self-defense laws, immunity for gun manufacturers from lawsuits for injuries caused by illegal use of their uh, weapons. And they did this at the state level, and they started um, almost always in Florida. Why did they start in Florida? Well, um, I talk about a woman in the book, Marion Hammer. She's uh, in her 70s. She's four foot 11. She's, uh, pro she never went to law school. Um, I'm actually not sure whether she uh, graduated from college. She's probably the most powerful lobbyist in Florida. Uh, and that's where the NRA begins its campaigns, uh, so much so that, the, that Florida is often referred to as the gunshine state within <laughs> uh, within the NRA circles, uh, but then they use that that precedent and go to the next you know most sympathetic state and the next most sympathetic state. So that by the time this issue got to the Supreme Court in 2008, 
the vast majority of states already recognized an individual right to bear arms, making it a much less significant leap for the Supreme Court to recognize a federal constitutional right to bear arms. It's an amazing story. Eight, 11 states, as you say, in the 1980s and 90s uh, take up the NRA's call and explicitly protect an individual right. Is that, uh, some scholars have argued that the Supreme Court should look to state constitutions in trying to interpret federal rights. Once all those states recognize it as an individual right, was it appropriate for the Supreme Court to do so as well? Well, you know, the, so, the, so uh, was it appropriate? I mean, it's interesting. If you read the Supreme Court's decision in this area um, on this question, it's entirely an originalist account. There is no reference to the fact that the states have developed these rights. I mean, there's references to the state constitutional provisions that existed at the time. Uh, it's an entirely originalist account. But, it, but, I, but, but my own sen sense is that 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 opening only was available because the notion of an individual right to bear arms, which had been rejected as frivolous, fraudulent for so long, um, had been given a kind of legitimacy, not only by the work in the states, but also the NRA funded scholars to uh, do essentially revisionist history and to argue for and uncover evidence uh, that there were uh, uh, understandings of the right to bear arms as an individual right at the time of the framing. They got Congress to adopt, endorse an individual right to bear arms in uh, two pieces of legislation before the issue got to the Supreme Court. They got the Justice Department. Um, when, when John Ashcroft became the Attorney General, he was a longtime NRA member, they got him to reverse the longstanding Justice Department position that the right to bear arms is not an individual right and is only a, a, a right of the states. Uh, he, he reverses that position before it gets to the Supreme Court. Then when it gets to the Supreme Court, they, 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 their, the coup, uh, their coup was to, sub, to organize an amicus brief in the Supreme Court submitted by a majority of the members of the House of Representatives, a, a majority of the uh, senators, and Dick Cheney. And the remarkable thing about Dick Cheney well, there's a lot of remarkable things about Dick Cheney, but the, this remarkable thing about Dick Cheney is that the Bush administration was actually defending the D.C. gun law, which was under attack in the Supreme Court. So there, the Bush administration was on this side of the dispute. And nonetheless, Dick Cheney signed a brief uh, challenge, you know, challenging the constitutionality of the same law um, uh, in the Supreme Court. That, that says a lot about Dick Cheney. Uh, but it also says a lot about the NRA, that they were able to gather that much sort of political force behind their, uh, behind their position. So on the originalism point, there's one other thing you can do on the interactive constitution. I won't pull it up. But Adam, I'm sure there are many other there are things many, you can there do. Are many, well, there are endless <laughs> learnings that are possible on this incredible online tool. But we have um, Adam Winkler and Nelson Lund, the leading liberal and conservative scholars of the Second Amendment, nominated by the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, with this common statement about the meaning of the Second Amendment. And they basically say, at the time of the framing, people weren't focused on whether it was an individual or collective right. They were focused mostly on whether the federal government could, could, would completely disarm citizens and uh, they wouldn't be able to protect liberty. But Winkler then says, by the time of Reconstruction, it, many people saw it as an individual right because they were concerned that African-American citizens be able to defend themselves against mobs. But I take from your book, that history, although interesting, is not decisive. And had it not been for this activism between, you know, in the 80s, 90s, and more recently, then the, the, uh, there wouldn't have been the political support for the right that the Supreme Court Well, that, that, that's, my, that's, my, that's number one. That's my sense. Number two, um, I, I, I make the argument in the book that, you know, even after the Supreme Court recognized the Second Amendment right to bear arms in 2008 uh, and then applied it to the states in 2010, um, it's not the Supreme Court, or indeed the Second Amendment as interpreted by the court, that is the principal protector of gun rights for Americans. It's still the NRA. Um, their power, which is a political power, um, is um, quite remarkable. And they are able to block laws. I mean, we've, we've seen it after Sandy Hook. They blocked the universal background check uh, law that clearly would be constitutional under the court's re reading of the Second Amendment. And they're able to um, uh, succeed in getting enacted all kinds of laws that the Second Amendment does not, in fact, 
uh, require uh, under the current court's reading. So they are the real um, protector of, uh, of of this right. And you know whether you agree with the right or not, I think it's re you really can learn a lot from seeing how they went about um, uh, protecting and have gone about protecting and preserving and advancing uh, this right. It's it's a it's a it's a pretty remarkable um, uh, story in, in, in my view. You are sympathetic to the Second Amendment activists who enacted this change. The NRA, as you know, was initially squeamish. They didn't want the case to press forward because they thought the Supreme Court might rule against it, although they eventually came around. What is it that makes you admire the citizen activists that you talk about in the book? Well, I think, I think it's that they, they um, uh, you know, and I have been accused of being a liberal. So, um, so it's not <laughs> a so card much. Carrying liberal. It's, yeah, it's not so much that I'm, uh, you know, th th this is my this is my uh, cause, um, but uh, but rather um, I respect the their commitment to the cause, their focus on the cause, and their understanding that political engagement, democratic engagement, is critical to the protection of constitutional rights. They don't leave it to the courts. Uh, and I don't think we can leave it to the courts more generally. I think we can all learn from this that if you care about a constitutional right, you, you, you need to you know, find those, those groups of citizens who share your vision and work with them uh, in, in political ways to shore up and advance that right. That's, that is what the NRA has understood from day one and been incredible, well, not from day one, from 1975 when they became a kind of political, they adopted a political focus. Um, they, you know, they, they've been around, they were around since the uh, post-Civil War period. They were founded by Union generals who were astounded at how bad uh, shots the, uh, the Union uh, soldiers were. And so they were created as a marksmanship organization. But in 75, they became a, they adopted a political office and, and this campaign really began. And, and I think, you know, from that day, they recognized that, that the constitutional right of, of the individual right to bear arms turns on political engagement of committed citizens. So I hear you saying that rather than focusing on the bad Supreme Court decisions, liberal supporters of gun regulation should instead try to mobilize citizens on their own. How can they do that? Well, you know, the, the, absolutely. This is the, this is the, uh, the, really, I think, the only way. Um, uh, there are, of course, gun control groups. Um, the Brady Center, uh, probably the most um, well-known. The, 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 the gun control groups, however, have been um, uh, hampered in a number of ways. One is that they've been focused in Washington. Whereas, the, whereas, as I show in the book, the action was out of the states. Um, two is that they don't have the, anything like the size of, uh, of the NRA. They haven't really tried to build membership. And one of the things the NRA really does is focus on its members, uh, you know, give its members a sense of identity, that they, who they are as people is NRA members. I, you know, I don't think Brady Center people think that's who I am as a person. I'm a Brady Center people uh, person. Um, but the uh, but but uh, I'm you know I think that that now Mayor Bloomberg, uh, who started a group called first called Mayors for Gun Safety and now it's called Every Town for Gun Safety, uh, that's a I think that's an effort an early effort to try to match what the NRA is doing that is to have locally based um, organizations affiliated in a national campaign, um, but with a with a representation at the local and state level where most of these fights. Occur, and you know we may see uh, this 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 issue shift. I mean, I, all, every issue shifts over over time, but it only moves in the direction you want to move it in if uh, you have uh, sufficient uh, organizations with sufficient focus and resources to, to to push the issue. You also talk about the tremendous importance of messaging, and you quote Kane Robinson, former NRA president telling you the threat's the thing, the most important thing in motivating the members is the threat. Understanding the gravity of the threat is what produces action. Tell us about that, and if the other side were crafting a similar message to galvanize people, what would it be? Yeah, so, yeah, the threat, right, this, this is uh, Kane Robinson, who's former, former president of the, of the NRA. I spoke with many former presidents of the NRA, and um, this was a, a, a fairly consistent theme, and I think it, you see it in their, um, you know, in their reaction to, almost any uh, effort to regulate guns. It's a little bit 
you know, like the ACLU's reaction to almost any effort to regulate speech. They see a slippery slope everywhere. They see a parade of horribles with every first step. And um, they play that up to their, uh, to their uh, members um, to energize them and to engage them and to get them uh, involved. So, um, uh, and they've been, they have a very, very committed membership. The, the NRA has 5 million members. It has another 15 million people who say they're members but don't pay their dues. Uh, and the NRA would like, you know, because they think, well, my father, my grandfather, my great grandfather, they were all members, so I must be a member. Or um, I bought a, you know, a gun, so I must be a member. Or what, whatever. I'm, I'm 65, so I must be a member. No, that's the ARP. So, <laughs> the, they, but, the, but they're, they're, they, you know, the NRA would love to have the dues from those 15 million people, but what they really want is their support. Um, and and these, uh, a significant portion of the NRA's members and supporters will act on the NRA's. Um, uh, recommendations in terms of who they vote for um, uh, 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 and wh whether they'll call their representatives, um, flood the uh, offices with uh, protests and the like. And, and, and members of Congress and members of state legislatures are, agree that this is really the power of the NRA. It's the power of its people who are motivated by this message about uh, the, 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 the threat that our guns will be taken away. On the other side, you know, the threats are, the, are they're, they're, not, they're not threats, the, the reality of gun violence, which is horrific in our country. Uh, gun violence uh, far uh, outstripping almost any other country. You know, we are sort of the world's leader. We're supposedly the world, the, the, the leader of the free world. We are clearly the leader of the incarcerated world. We have the, uh, the most incarcerated people per capita of any country in the world. Um, but we also are the leader of the gu gun violence uh, 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 in the world, you know, outside of countries that are enmeshed in war. I mean, Syria, I think there's more gun violence. But in, 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 in a country at peace, I don't think there's any other country that has as much gun violence as we have. And, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of innocent victims who, uh, are, are, um, uh, who, who die as a result of our... Um, protection of the of the right to bear arms, and I, you know I think that's a that is a powerful message. You see it after every mass shooting, uh, and it's you know it it, it 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 hasn't built to a crescendo that would actually create significant um, uh, reform yet. But um, you know it, it could. That case that it really is vulnerable members of society who are the victims of gang violence is very strong. Yeah. Because we were discussing it one last beat. Share with the audience how many guns there are in the United States per capita and what you think would be necessary really to reduce that. Yeah, so this is one of the challenges with regulating guns is, is simply the physical fact that there are 300 million guns in the United States. There's about 300 million people in the United States. So that's one gun per person. I'm sure you all brought yours. But um, <laughs> uh, so, so, so how do you go about um, regulating guns, given that fact. Uh, you could pass a law banning the production of guns across the board tomorrow, uh, but there'd still be 300 million guns, and those, there would be a tremendous black market. And as the, as the NRA says, you know, if you outlaw guns, the outlaws will still have guns. Um, uh, and I think that's true, particularly when we are as saturated as we are. This, this, the second most gun-saturated country in the world is Yemen. And they have uh, 55 guns per 100 people. We have something like 90 guns per 100 people. Um, uh, so that's a real challenge. Uh, Australia um, was a very sort of, in some ways, similar to us, a kind of a frontiersman, cowboy, you know, kind of culture, very, very much believed in and liked their guns. Um, they had a, a horrific mass shooting, and the country galvanized around it and enacted fairly stringent gun uh, licensing laws, but also did a massive buyback. Uh, and that's, I think, you know, if, if we were ever to, 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 to move to a gun control model, it, it would require a massive buyback of, of guns. And no, lots of people wouldn't sell their guns. Um, but, you know, so if you put the price high enough, a significant number would, and that would, uh, uh, that would help. Great. Well, not great for the country, but great for the discussion of the Second Amendment. Uh, let us now turn to marriage equality. You begin your description of this riveting social transformation by noting that when Evan Wolfson uh, 
the uh, activist was a student in Harvard Law School in the 1980s and wrote the paper that would anticipate Justice Kennedy's constitutional arguments upholding marriage equality, the paper was considered so far-fetched that he couldn't get a faculty member to supervise it and eventually convinced a trust in a states professor to take him on. How, it's, a, it's a complicated story with a lot of moving parts, but why don't you sum up how we move from a world where Evan Wolfson couldn't get a faculty supervisor to his paper to 45 years later, Justice Kennedy recognizes those arguments as the law of the land. Yeah. So Evan is uh, an important part of the story and an important part of my uh, story here. He did write a 141-page paper in the days before word processing. Um, got a B-plus for it. <laughs> um, but, he, but he didn't stop there. Um, you know, he, he, he went out and he became uh, a gay rights lawyer at Lambda Legal Defense, which was one of the premier uh, gay rights organizations in the country at the time. Uh, he worked there uh, on pushing for marriage equality first within the gay rights community because there was a lot of um, dispute within the community as to whether this was really the right thing to do or not. Um, uh, he then left Lambda in 2002 and created Freedom to Marry, and a single issue organization dedicated solely to the uh, recognition of, uh, of marriage equality. And they existed from 2002 to 2015 when the court recognized the right and they disbanded because they had succeeded. In that period of time, 13 years, they didn't file a single case. Uh, and yet they were one of the biggest actors in the marriage equality field. Um, and what they did was they did all the work that needed to be done outside of the courts in order to make it possible for these kinds of victories to win inside the courts. Public messaging, uh, referendum campaigns, many, many states had referendum campaigns, um, uh, a uh, advocacy and activism at, in, the, in, in the legislatures, uh, in, in, in municipalities and the like. But it wasn't, you know, Evan Wolfson and Freedom to Marry alone. There were a number of other organizations that were critical to this story. GLAAD, which is a, a national gay rights organization in Boston, um, the ACLU, Lesbian Rights Gay Pro uh, uh, Project. Um, but what they did was in some ways similar to what the NRA did. They, they couldn't file a case in federal court. In fact, someone tried. In 1972, uh, a gay couple sued in federal court to say, we have a right to uh, marry on the same terms as heterosexual couples. And uh, that case went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court dismissed it with a one sentence, uh, a one sentence saying, this doesn't even present a substantial federal question. We don't even have to address the merits. Um, so they couldn't file a case in federal court, and they didn't file a case in federal court. Instead, they, like the NRA, engaged in a kind of federalist strategy of patient incrementalism, going out to the states uh, and trying, starting with their most, uh, you know, their favorite states, which was not Florida, uh, but was Vermont, uh, uh, under, uh, understandably, um, uh, and, and New England generally. And what they did was they first tried to um, they sought modest family law reforms to recognize the rights of gay couples to adopt kids and the like. Uh, they then uh, sought to get domestic partnership benefits recognized by friendly companies, universities, by some municipalities, by some states. They started small on the, which benefits would be recognized for domestic partners, but they then expanded them sort of incrementally so that by the by the time the question came up in California of whether gay couples should have a right to marry, under California state law, gay couples already under domestic partnership had all the rights and benefits of marriage except for the name marriage. Um, they got non-discrimination laws enacted at the local and sometimes at the state level, hate crimes laws, and only then did they file suits seeking the right to marry, and only in state courts and only on state uh, constitutional law grounds. because. As long as you don't raise a federal claim, the case remains in the state. It can't go to the federal uh, system. And they didn't want to go to the federal system until they had made sufficient headway. Just like the NRA was very leery about the filing of the case, the Heller versus DC case that led to the, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court's decision, the, the, the gay rights group said, you know, we, we recognize that the court, if the court's going to recognize marriage, it's only going to be after we've made substantial headway uh, at the state level. And they did um, ultimately make substantial headway at the state level. They got civil unions in Vermont, then they got uh, marriage, uh, fam uh, most famously, in, in Massachusetts, and they took those victories to 
places like, and repeated them in places like Connecticut and Iowa and California. In each place they had to, you know, getting a state victory wasn't, court victory wasn't enough. They then had to defend those victories through the political referendum process. Prop 8 was the California political referendum process where they lost uh, after spending $40 million and the people of California overturned a California decision that recognized marriage equality. Um, but they, but that's, that's essentially what they did. So that again, by the time the case got to the Supreme Court, it wasn't that the arguments were different. The arguments made in 2015 were the same as the arguments made in 1972 and the arguments made in Evan Wolfson's paper. Um, it wasn't that the court was more liberal. If anything, the court was more liberal in 1972 than it was in 2015. What changed were the facts on the ground, the culture around the dignity, the equal dignity and worth of uh, gay and lesbian uh, 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 citizens. Uh, and, and that's what made this argument, which was unthinkable, um, uh, inevitable. And it wouldn't have happened without that careful, strategic, incremental uh, work in, in a variety of contexts, again, mostly outside the federal courts. It's a dramatic story. And I want to ask a little more about backlash. So as you know, uh, gay rights advocates like the NRA were reluctant to go to the Supreme Court because they thought the time wasn't ripe. And then you talk about the response to the Goodrich decision in Massachusetts. Before Goodrich, 13 states had constitutional amendments against same-sex marriage. By the end of 2006, 27 states banned same-sex marriage by constitutional amendments. You say in the short term it was a setback, but in the long term uh, this was helpful because the backlash helped to galvanize more support. I guess the question is, could it have gone the other way? Is it possible that the backlash could have stopped the movement or the Supreme Court might have jumped in too early or rejected the right? What's yeah. the advice to the advocates in retrospect to, because timing is obviously so right. important. So it's, all, it's, it's certainly possible. And, and you know, there's a, whenever you're trying to advance uh, a notion that isn't already recognized, there's gonna be the risk uh, of backlash. Um, and there certainly was uh, a significant backlash there. I and mean, I, think, I think in retrospect, people do say, in some sense, the backlash um, gave more attention and legitimacy to the issue than the gay rights groups themselves could have given it. You know, the, the very fact that there was such a, such a kind of movement to undo the progress that they have made made people realize how important that progress was. Um, people who might otherwise have stayed on the sidelines. And so they came in with money, with support, with volunteering. Um, and the other thing I think is, is important, I don't know that you can all, ever really predict whether, you know, whether the backlash is going to be good or bad. But what you can do is learn from the backlash. And, and one of the stories I tell in the book is sort of the, the, how they learn from the Proposition 8 defeat. Proposition 8 was a backlash to the California Supreme Court decision. Um, and it was very dispiriting. It was, in two, and it was in 2008 when we elected Obama, and nonetheless, the California voters voted uh, to, to overturn marriage equality. Um, but what they did, what the gay rights groups did, was they, they sort of came together. They said, let's study how we advocate for this issue in the public arena. Uh, and um, they did focus groups, they did surveys, they... Um, completely revamped their messaging between the Prop 8 campaign and the 2012 referenda campaign where there were four states, Maine, Washington, Michigan, and Maryland, that had um, marriage equality on, uh, on the ballot. And they won all, all four of those. Uh, and what was the difference? Well, if you look at the California ads, and you can actually look at them on YouTube. I describe them in the, in the book. But they're, 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 they talk about this as a, as a struggle for equal rights and, and, and justice like the struggle against Japanese internment and, and segregation. Um, and they have, you know, um, an, another ad where there's a cool kind of gay guy talking about marriage equality and then a kind of frumpy, middle-aged, very uncool, you know, uh, guy expressing concerns. Those, that's not the way you reach the persuadable voters by analogizing them to racists, um, uh, and by showing that they're uncool, you know, and, and instead what you have, well, so you look, then you look at the, the ads uh, that they ran in Maine. They're all real people, not actors. The, they're, they're, they're from the state. The older, the better. The more, you know, sort of decorated a military veteran, the better. They're all heterosexual. Um, and they all 
talk uh, personally about how they sort of came to, they, they struggled with this issue. Uh, it wasn't what they learned in, you know, growing up, or it wasn't what they learned in church, but, you know, that, and they almost always refer to someone they know who is gay or lesbian, and they talk about shouldn't that person have the same, uh, same right to express love and commitment that my wife and I have been able to have for the last 40 years. And it's really quite powerful. I mean, one of them shows, it features a, a 80 year old World War II bomber pilot sitting you know, with his entire family around his table and he talks about his, his lesbian granddaughter and her partner and he says, you know, you wanna talk about bravery, that's the real bravery. And it's just, it's just a completely different message and it, uh, and it worked, but that was uh, an instance of learning from your law, losing forward is how uh, Evan Wolfson talks about it. Um, very important to sort of uh, figure out what was going wrong and, and be able to shift in response. So after reading the incredible marriage equality story, what's the response to critics who say the courts are just following the polls and they shouldn't do that? Well, I think the, the courts are to some degree following the polls. I think, you know, there's, the, the, there's um, a number of studies that have shown that the court doesn't, it doesn't literally follow the polls. It doesn't take a poll. It doesn't, you know, assess the polls. But when you look sort of historically at where the Supreme Court's decisions are on constitutional questions, they rarely depart significantly from where the people are, um, uh, which again doesn't mean it's just a political process, but it also means that democratic engagement um, affects how the Constitution evolves. And I think that's a good thing. I think, you know, the Constitution uh, should speak to our values. Uh, it, it, has, it has authority over us because it's ours. Not because, you know, a bunch of dead old white men who weren't even, rep weren't even representative of a majority back then agreed to it. That has, what possible normative justification does that have for why we should be bound by it today? We should be bound by it today because over time we have been bound by it and it has evolved so that the Constitution we know and, and, uh, and, and revere today is very different in fundamental aspects from how it was then. And how did it change? Not, I would submit, by ju justices you know, wielding their pens to impose their views on the public, but rather recognizing the changes that are occurring in, uh, in society, as I think Justice Kennedy did in his, uh, in his Obergefell uh, decision on marriage equality. One more beat on this because it's so important. I mean, one thing you show is that the polls don't change easily. It takes three oh, yeah, decades yeah, of organization yeah. and a lot of uh, activism to change the public opinion. Justice Ginsburg has said judges don't follow the passions of the moment but the sentiments of the era or something more eloquent than yeah, that. Yeah. There's some notion that deep-seated constitutional views of the people are different than their quick, uh, you know, political results. But what do I tell my students when I teach constitutional law and I tell them about this great book, which I will because it's so important, about how there's something about the Constitution that transcends politics? Yeah, so I, I definitely am a believer in the Constitution transcending politics. One of the reasons you need a Constitution is because a democracy doesn't do everything well. It particularly doesn't protect minorities well. It especially doesn't protect uh, the criminally accused well. And so you need to, and you know, um, uh, encapsulate certain rights above the political process. And then you need a court which is insulated from the political process to a degree um, to uh, protect and support those. So it's not just politics, but I think there is a constitutional politics. And I think the point you, you know, that you opened with, which is that these things ha take a, a significant amount of time. They don't change overnight. It's, a, it's, it's really a process of deliberation. That, that's what the NRA was engaged in at the, at the state level. That's what the gay rights groups were engaged in at the state level. That's, in fact, what the human rights groups were engaged in in the post-9-11 era. It's a process of public deliberation which eventually creates a kind of legal culture that the court then recognizes as the sentiment of the era. Um, you know, and it never says, we hereby recognize this is the sentiment of the era. <laughs> you know, although Justice Kennedy came close in his Obergefell decision in talking about the, you know, the, the truths we see today, which we didn't see, uh, we didn't see yesterday. Uh, but, you know, the, I, I, you know the, to me, the Constitution has to change. If it's going to remain vital for us as we go forward as a society, it has to reflect the fact that we evolve. Um, and to me, it's better that it does so through a democratic 
democratic constitutional politics than uh, it being imposed, either being straightjacketed to the past, which I think would render it, um, you know, irrelevant increasingly, uh, or imposed uh, upon us by, uh, by, you know, philosopher kings. And what would you see to pers what would you say to persuade an originalist, a student who was an originalist? Justice Scalia has said, used to say, had said, it was okay to look at what state constitution said was cruel and unusual punishment to define its meaning today. Should an originalist say, hey, look at all these new states that have recognized the right to bear arms as an individual right, and that's relevant in figuring out what it means today? Well, you know, I think cruel and unusual. I, 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 I don't know what I'd say to an original. I mean, to an, here's what I would say to an originalist. Number one. Uh, the, the project is, is deeply um, uh, problematic in trying to figure out what the framers thought, for example, about GPS devices on cars. That's just a problematic <laughs> inquiry. Uh, but number two, and more importantly, even if we could figure out what Thomas Jefferson thought about that, he was a smart, he was a smart guy, um, you know, why should we care? Why should we be bound today by, by his views? We should only be bound by his views if those views have withstood the test of time, a test imposed by our culture as we move forward. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm very definitely not, I don't, I, I'm not an originalist. I don't, I, I think you start there. Uh, of course you start there. The Constitution started there, but it has evolved over time. There are very few originalists, uh, in fact, uh, on, uh, on the court. Um, there have been very few. And I, you know, when Justice Scalia died, I wrote a piece saying, you know, he's, he may be one of the least influential, most influential judge, justices of our, of, 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 in history. You know, very obviously brilliant, great writer. Um, uh, I love to teach his opinions uh, because they're so well um, uh, 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 written. Um, but uh, in fact, I, I went to Justice Scalia's uh, memorial and Justice Thomas talked about how when Scalia would finish an opinion, He'd often call Justice Thomas and say, Clarence, I, I, you, you got to hear this. And then he would read him his whole opinion. He was so proud of how well it was written. Um, uh, but I think, you know, I think, but, you know, in fact, Scalia was in dissent a lot more than he was in the majority uh, on a lot of the big issues of, uh, 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 that, that the court took up during his tenure. And, you know, sometimes great justices like Justice Brandeis uh, are in dissent, but they're prescient, uh, and they sort of see what's coming down the line, and, and so their views articulated in dissent become majority views. I very much doubt that's going to be the case with much of Justice Scalia's views, because he's looking backward, not forward. He's, not pre he's the opposite of prescient. Um, and so as we move further and further away from that original time, uh, the, what, the, what that original time thought is going to be less and less determinative of what um, the Constitution ought to mean for us as a society. Great. Um, as always, I am blown away by the excellence of our audience questions, and I want to get to them. So let's just take one beat on your last discussion, which is of the evolution of constitutional understanding so that rights for enemy combatants held abroad, NSA surveillance, the status of Guantanamo changed relatively quickly. Here, the people who were mobilized were not American citizens as a whole over decades, but military officials, international audiences, tell us about the similarities and differences between that story of constitutional change and the first two. Yeah, so one thing is that if you're talking about national security um, initiatives by the president, you don't have the option that the gay rights and gun rights groups do of going to the states, because the states really don't have much to say about what president, you know, whether President Bush tortures people or not. Um, and, and so you have, but you have to find alternative fora. Uh, and, you know, some of it was domestic, some of it was, uh, was international. The domestic, I would say, um, really preceded 9-11. And I talk about the reaction to Korematsu. Korematsu, the case that upheld the Japanese internment during World War II, that was not accepted by civil society. Civil society groups, Japanese American groups, and the ACLU fought for decades to essentially get that decision reversed in, through the eye, in the judgment of history. And they succeeded uh, eventually in 1984, uh, eight, uh, President Reagan signed uh, a law that uh, formally apologized to the internees and paid reparations to the, um, uh, to the, to, to all, to the people who, the survivors. Um, that I think played a critical role in 
the court, in how the court viewed President Bush's claims of unchecked executive power. We'll, look how we dealt with FDR's claims of unchecked executive power. It didn't go that well, did it? Um, maybe we ought not do that here. And not only you know, was there that, that 40 year history, but uh, Korematsu himself filed an amicus brief in the Supreme Court in the Guantanamo cases saying, don't make this mistake again. So there was that long term deliberative uh, engagement that paid off, I think, after 9-11, even though it began well before 9-11. Uh, and I think that you know, underscores how you have to keep these battles going, even when there's not an immediate sort of threat. Um, but the other thing that the, the groups did was they did, a, I think, really quite remarkable transnational advocacy. And I uh, talk about Clive Stafford Smith, who's a, a US and British citizen national, heads up a group called Reprieve that, that uh, that represented uh, 85 people at Guantanamo. Um, of those 85, I think 70 plus uh, have been uh, released. Not one of them because a court ordered their release. Uh, Clive and Reprieve did file habeas petitions in court challenging the detention of their clients, but that's not all they did. They went to the country from which those people came. They gathered up their family members. They held press conferences and did media briefings that brought the, you know, the wrongs of, uh, that were being inflicted on their clients to the population that was most likely to care about it, their own nation. Uh, and then, th then they um, built that um, uh, concern to put pressure on those governments to in turn put pressure uh, on the United States. And I tell in, in, in detail the story of the Brits, the British detainees who were the first to be released from Guantanamo. When they were first sent to Guantanamo, Tony Blair, who was a big friend of George W., you know, said, nothing wrong with what's being going on at Guantanamo. They're being treated very well. Uh, we should have no concerns. Um, but Clive Stafford Smith and a number of other um, lawyers uh, worked together to, uh, to bring public attention to, uh, to bear on the way people were being held at Guantanamo, the kinds of trials that they were going to be subjected to and the like. And they turned British public opinion around. And then that put pressure on Blair. And Blair had to reverse himself and demand that Bush release the detainees. He did then release the detainees because he needed Blair's support. As Soon as the detainees got out, they um, told their stories of how they'd been treated, including uh, dis very dis specific descriptions of torture. Uh, those stories came out a month before the Supreme Court in the United States heard the first Guantanamo case, which had nothing to do with torture. And nonetheless, the justices asked about torture because those messages had come across the pond. Paul Clement, who was representing the United States, um, said, oh, um, you know, you don't need to worry about torture. We don't torture. Uh, and then that week, CBS 60 Minutes um, released the pictures from Abu Ghraib, which were not at Guantanamo, but were remarkably similar to the specific detailed accounts that the Guantanamo detainees uh, had described. And that certainly had an effect on the court's refusal to accept something that the courts had traditionally accepted, which was a president's assertion that I should have unchecked authority uh, w with respect to how I deal with the enemy during an armed conflict. It's a remarkable story. Of course, this is, would have been Justice Scalia's worst nightmare, that the courts could be moved by public opinion abroad, uh, by international <laughs> public opinion. Horrible. In fact, it's a story. And you tie it back to the American tradition in your beautiful quotation in the conclusion. Lincoln, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Um, in order to get the rest of the great story of the detainees, read the book, which I want you to do, but we've just got phenomenal questions, so let's get through as many of them as we can. Doesn't your thesis have dangerous consequences? What stops a demagogue from upending our constitutional values? Nothing. So, I mean, you know, yes, I mean, yes, it does. I mean, and, and in some sense, this is, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure it's my thesis that has uh, dangerous consequences. I think this is reality. Uh, there is no uh, there is no parchment that can protect us against ourselves. We have to protect ourselves. And so if there's a demagogue, we have to fight against that demagogue. Um, uh, uh, you know, I quote Judge uh, Learned Hand in the book, um, one of the uh, 
one of the, the probably the greatest judge not, not to sit on the Supreme Court. And he said, uh, liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. Uh, when it dies there, no court, no constitution, no law can save it. While it lies there, it needs no constitution, no court, no law to save it. Now, like many great quotes, that's an overstatement. You need, I think you need courts, you need a constitution, you need laws. Uh, but I think it recognizes the critical importance of, uh, 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 of liberty lying in us. And my, my sense is that it is, it is in civil society, in nonprofit organizations focused on co constitutional rights. I mean, this is part of civil society right here, the National Constitution Center, that, that nourish and nurture that liberty that is essential. And that's the protection against demagogues, not a piece of paper uh, and, a, you know, and nine justices. Thank you for that. That's high praise, and that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to be a convening space to be part of this constitutional conversation, and that's why it's so important that you're all here at coming at the evening to educate yourself so you can be part of this great constitutional conversation as well, which you've done with these phenomenal questions. How have the dynamics of civil activism changed from the civil rights movement to the present? Uh, another great question. So, um, yeah, I mean, in some sense, this, this is an old story. Um, you know, you, if you look at the movements for constitutional amendments, they, they sort of start at the state level, they build up momentum, and then they jump the tracks to federal uh, amendments. And you, you can't really amend the Constitution any longer, it seems. But, um, uh, but there is a similarity. Um, I mean, I think there are differences. The, the, the take the, the, uh, the struggle to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson, it was a... It was largely from the standpoint, of, and it's been told as a story, largely from the standpoint of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as a federal court strategy. Um, incremental, uh, very strategic, but focused on, in the federal courts, um, not in the states. Why? Because you know, the, the, the state forums were the last place they wanted to be in the South. Um, uh, so they, 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 they focused on the, uh, on the federal courts. But, um, and they, and in, that, in those days, you know, it was considered somehow, you know, dirty hands for lawyers to kind of engage in public advocacy strategies outside of courts. Uh, uh, but, you know, in, in reality, what uh, finally achieved some end to Jim Crow segregation was, was a political movement of the civil, the civil rights movement in conjunction with what the courts uh, were doing and what Congress uh, did so you had to have that political movement in order to achieve the right that they were seeking the equal rights uh, for women uh, same thing the court recognizes that discrimination against women is suspect when when feminism is 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 sort of uh, uh, has spread throughout uh, the nation and and in large part through the effort to unsuccessful effort to enact the Equal Rights Amendment, but the court ultimately had sort of interpreted the Constitution as if the Equal Rights Amendment had been adopted for, for all uh, practical purposes. So, you know, I think, I think today um, lawyers are more self-conscious about this, and there are, you know, groups like Freedom to Marry, which are lawyers' organizations, but recognize the importance of all the advocacy work that needs to be done outside the courts. Um, I think in the human rights field, hugely different. And if you think back to World War I, World War II, first of all, there weren't human rights in the kind of international human rights uh, field. Second of all, there weren't human rights organizations. The, you know, the Human Rights Watch, Human Rights First, uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights. There was the ACLU, but that was about it. Um, today, there's a whole you know, transnational culture of human rights, which, which these groups were able to kind of um, invoke to bring pressure to bear uh, on the United States. And that simply didn't exist um, uh, you know, before World War II. Uh, what is your prediction of today's argument on immigration and President Obama's executive order? And have immigration advocates done a sufficient job in mobilizing public opinion in defense of immigrants' rights? Well, this is, a, this is one where you know, immigration advocates, I think, have done a tremendous job but anti-immigration advocates have done a very powerful job as well. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's a fight which we will continue, no matter what the Supreme Court does today, uh, this is a fight that we will continue to have. And I think, you know, one of my first, uh, one of my earlier books was called Enemy Aliens, and about the ways in which we sort of trade on the 
the cost benefits between the between liberty and uh, and security by sacrificing the rights of the other, the foreign national, the immigrant, and how that has led us down the dark path all too many times. So I'm very sympathetic to immigrants' rights. I think there is a, um, a, a very powerful movement there, but there's a very powerful movement on the other side. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's not, uh, it's, that's, that's one of the battles that we will continue to fight in the, in the next, uh, for the next generation. Uh, do you see any progress for death penalty abolition? Is there a citizens' movement for that change, especially post glossip? Yeah, I, absolutely, and I think there, there, are, you know, there already has been a substantial amount of progress. In fact, initially, I was thinking about doing the death penalty movement as one of my uh, case studies. Um, I, I, I felt like you know, there's only so much space between the covers to, 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 to tell stories, and three was enough, but. Um, but I think they've done a, they've done a very uh, um, aggressive and, and strategic job at pushing back against the death penalty in public messaging in the states, in the courts. And, you know, as, as, as your reference indicates, uh, Justice Breyer, anyway, seems to believe that it may be time for this kind of issue to be teed up to the court. I do think that in our lifetime, the death penalty will be uh, abolished and probably the final you know, um, nail in the coffin will be will be the Supreme Court, but it won't be imposed by Justice Breyer and Justice Kennedy. It will only be because of this tremendous amount of work that's been done. Speaking of Justice Breyer, are there any Supreme Court justices who are transparent about or recognize or acknowledge the work of activists uh, in their work? If so, which justices in which cases? Uh, I, I would say none. Um, maybe, maybe Judge Learned Hand uh, in that quote that I gave you. Um, uh, you know, it, it, but, but this is, um, you know, in a way, you know, a, a justice would, not, would never say, well, I am uh, voting this way because I recognize that people have, have changed their views. I, I, the, 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 the most explicit uh, assertion of that that I think I could point to would be uh, what I said before, Justice Kennedy's in Obergefell. But, you know, it's not, that's not all he says. He also engages in a kind of traditional doctrinal elaboration of the right of privacy by looking at why we protected marriage for heterosexual couples and why it should be any different for same-sex couples. That's a traditional common law method of, of, of interpretation. So, um, so I think it's, I think this this is what drives constitutional change. It's not what justices point to in justifying their decisions. Uh, we are almost out of time. We have two excellent Citizens United related questions. How is citizen activism affected by Citizens United? And the second question says it seems extremely counterintuitive that Citizens United is more likely to be changed through a slow state by state process as opposed to the rapid addition of a single left leaning member of the court. <laughs> Well, you know, so, 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 so my book is called, the subtitle of my book is The Power of Citizen Activists to Make Constitutional Law. But you've now heard my, my thesis. It's not really about activists. It's about organizations. So had the term already not been taken, the subtitle would have been The Power of Citizens United <laughs> to Make Constitutional <laughs> Law. Um, but in terms of, you know, I, I actually have, I have a piece in, the, uh, in, the, in this month's uh, issue of The Atlantic um, about um, how to reverse Citizens United, and applying the lessons of this book to that uh, campaign. And I say, you know, it's, 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 there, there actually are uh, a significant number of organizations that are engaged at the local level in trying to advance various progressive reforms and demonstrate that they work and then move them to other states, particularly in the area of public financing, reporting, and transparency. Um, uh, and I think that's the way it will happen. I don't think it'll happen because of some dramatic, you know, constitutional amendment campaign, even though that does serve an educational purpose. I don't think we're going to amend the First Amendment to overturn Citizens United. I don't think we'll get it, obviously we won't get it from Larry Lessig running for president on a campaign finance reform ticket. That didn't get us very far. But I do think this kind of patient incrementalism is likely to get us there. Um, and you know, a, a, a new justice will make a difference, uh, to be sure. But, um, you know, I, I wrote a piece for The Post recently that said, um, 
you know, everybody's all, liberals are all excited and conservatives are all nervous about the prospect that the Democrats might put uh, someone on the court and, sh and take away the conservative majority that's been in place for about 40 years uh, on the court. But that actually, if you, if, you, if you look at history, it's not new justices that change constitutional law. It is this extensive period of democratic deliberation that then gets recognized. And new justices are part of that. So the fact that um, you know, Hillary and, and Bernie and Donald, uh, I'm on first name basis with all of them, <laughs> you, know, uh, uh, you know, all are critical of Citizens United is reflective of the fact that 80% of the American public are, is critical of Citizens United, including 70% of Republicans. Uh, and that will shape who gets put on the court, not in a litmus test kind of way, I don't think, but in a, uh, in a way that will make, you know, create an opening. But that's just an opening. And the, the, what it requires is, a real, is, you know, this kind of dialogue and debate. But I, I think we're having it about Citizens United. I think there's a, uh, you know, and the other, the other flip side of that is, you know, Citizens United does make it more difficult to, uh, to change, uh, particularly on this issue, because there are entrenched, wealthy, interests who uh, very much will be opposed to changing the rules with respect to campaign finance. And uh, Citizens United, you know, sort of lets them free. Um, uh, but we have no choice but to, to fight back. I think. Great. We have to stop. We have about 15 minutes of David's time before he's got to catch a train. So jog with me out. I think the book signing is on the first floor, unless it's on the first floor, and we'll go down and sign this book. But ladies and gentlemen, this is an incredibly empowering story because it really tells each of you that you have the ability to pick a particular vision of the Constitution, to fight for it, and to change our constitutional understanding. For that, and for his great work, please join me in thanking David Cole.